Gracious and loving God, we come now before you to hear your word, to have our hearts transformed by what you would say. Gracious Lord, help us to be in the presence of your transfiguration, and help us to be a people who share your transfiguration with others. For these things we pray. Peter and James and John never expected to find what they did on that mountaintop. They had been with Jesus for probably over two years by this point. They had learned from him. They had witnessed his healings. They had seen him feed people. They had even sat down at a table and broke bread with him. By all means, they even had slid and lay in the dirt next to him as they slept at night while they were traveling around. He was a friend, he was their master, he was a teacher, but he was an ordinary guy to them other than that he was Lord. And that he could perform these miracles. And yet what they saw on top of that mountain was something entirely different. I'm sure that as they were going up the mountain, they expected it to be just like any other trip up the mountain. Jesus loved to pray in secluded places. They probably expected to go up there to find that no one else was there. And Jesus would sit down and pray. And perhaps he would teach the three of them something special just meant for their ears and not for all the disciples. They may have expected to see a beautiful vista but when they got to the mountaintop, they found that this friend, this teacher, this master, this guy who broke bread with them, who had slept in the dirt next to them, suddenly transfigured, transformed into this brilliant, white, shining being with clothing that shone like the sun that, and a body that just radiated. And they were frightened. And then, to add to this scene, suddenly these, these two figures who resemble all of the descriptions of Moses and Elijah are there talking with Jesus. And from their conversation, it became apparent that it was actually Moses and Elijah who, who had been dead or gone for over 400 years in the case of Elijah, and probably over 1,000, maybe 2,000 in the case of Moses. And here they were, these heroes of Israelite history, these heroes of the faith, there talking with, with their master, their teacher, this, this guy that they had been traveling around with it, that sure could perform miracles, but never, never had shown anything this wondrous to them. And in their fear, as they bowed down their faces to the ground, Peter says, it is good for us to be here. Master, let, let us make a tabernacle Three, one for you and, and one for Moses and one for Elijah so that we can worship you here. And now and we can create places where others can come and worship you and, and we can see you in your glory and, and the world will know your power and they'll see Moses and they'll hear Elijah and, and everything great and wonderful and, and the religion and the faith will be proven. And you can just hear Peter just misunderstanding the point. That rather than being in the moment and appreciating what he was seeing, he's off and thinking about what the future holds. There's no other reason to build a place of worship. And Moses and Elijah certainly would not have wanted to be worshipped. And as Peter finishes making his great proclamation, a proclamation of love, but of misunderstanding, Suddenly, the area is overshadowed by cloud. In fact, the entire top of the mountain is just covered in cloud, just like in the days of Moses and Elijah. And they hear 
the voice of God. So not only have their eyes been opened to Jesus' glory, now their ears have been opened to hear God speak, and He says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. And they finally dare to look again, and the clouds are gone. And there's only Jesus standing there. And he's back in his normal everyday robes. And Moses and Elijah are gone. And he says it's time to go back down the mountain. I can almost hear them speak as they're coming down the mountain. I can, I can hear the excitement in their voices as they talked about what they had just witnessed about the fact that they had just seen Moses and Elijah and, and that Jesus had somehow transformed into his glory and that they saw the Son of God in his full glory. There in their midst that, that their teacher, their master was, was this, this divine being. And Jesus comes and orders them and says, you can't talk about any of this. Don't recount the story to anyone until after the Son of Man rises from the dead. The story of the Transfiguration is not a story that is easy to believe unless you were there. In fact, Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, talks about how much of the gospel, much of the stories of our good book are, are actually unbelievable by those who are outside of the faith. That their eyes have been veiled to the power of Jesus Christ. Their ears have been closed. They, they cannot relate to the stories that we find so inspirational, that we turn to, to bolster our faith. And I think it's no small wonder. Because how many of us are like the disciples, and we never expect much more than the ordinary every day? How many of us go to work and do office and paperwork or, or work in the field and expect to see Jesus there transfigured before us? How many of us go through our daily routines and expect to be there in the presence of the glorified Son of God and in the witness of the heroes that we read so much about on Sunday mornings and maybe hopefully in our daily devotions that we have become accustomed to the ordinary we expect to go up to the mountain and pray not to go up to the mountain to see the transfiguration our stories that, that provide us with so much hope and peace and joy fall on deaf ears to those who are outside these walls because they have not experienced them themselves. They are not a living story. They are a history of other people's stories who they don't know, who, who don't speak to them. And they are lost on those who are perishing. Those who don't know Jesus Christ, don't know that we can find and offer eternal life in His name. No one who doesn't have a moment where they encounter Jesus can read those stories and suddenly feel the need to get on their knees and repent for a life of sin and to ask for forgiveness and ask for Jesus to offer them eternal life and salvation. There are some who can read those stories and have a moment where Jesus does appear to them and the stories are open to them. But most, most 
need to hear the stories and the gospel of today. Those stories are veiled from their eyes and deafened on their ears. But our stories, our stories have the potential to show Jesus in a new way. And things that may seem ordinary to us, things that might just be a part of our daily lives of service to the world, have the opportunity to be a modern day transfiguration in the lives of someone else. A simple soup kitchen where we as Christians stand in line and serve soup and feed the bellies of the hungry has the power and the opportunity to become a transfiguration in the life of one of those persons who is there to receive food. If just one of us would step out of our place and line and maybe and go and sit down and have a real and honest conversation with them at the table over a meal. And maybe for the first time in ages, they would get to experience what it means to be cared for by someone else and have a meal with someone where they can talk and share their story, share their struggles. And maybe in that moment, if we were to truly take the time and listen and offer a friendship and a relationship, they could witness the transfiguration of Jesus Christ right before their eyes. And they could hear the stories of how Jesus has transfigured our lives. And they could see God for the first time. The veil would be removed. Their ears would be opened and they could hear God's voice speak. Perhaps, perhaps a simple conversation with an elderly person left in a care home can become the opportunity for transfiguration. If we were to go there and we were to truly listen to their story, to hear their pain and to hold it with them, to care about the sorrows, to know how they feel about losing their spouse whom they were with 50 years before they ended up in that home, how, how they have watched friend after friend get called home to glory while they got left behind. Maybe if we listen to the struggles of how their body no longer does what they, what they used to be able to do. And we were to, to embrace them in that. To show love and a concern. To build a relationship with them that will let them know that they are not alone. And that they can still make new friends and still have new people in their lives that care for them as much as those who have gone home before them. Maybe in those moments they can witness the transfiguration of Jesus Christ right here in their lives as we unveil the light of God from our own lives before them. gospel of Jesus Christ from 2,000 years ago may be veiled and hidden from the world by the ordinary and by the things of this world that would keep them in darkness. But there is a living gospel and a light of Christ that shines within us from the transfigurations that we witnessed because at some point in our lives somebody took enough interest in us, whether that was a pastor or a parent or a Sunday school teacher, to sit down and to show us that we mattered and that Jesus loved each and every one of us enough and that eternal life was possible for us. And that light 
was passed on to us and allowed to shine within our hearts. And note Paul's words. He said that it is veiled to the perishing, which means that if we do not step up and fulfill the mission of the church, if we do not share the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we do not allow them to have the opportunities to see Christ transfigured and to see the glory of God, they will die and are doomed to eternal damnation. They will die if we do not intercede and step in and show them that there is the opportunity for salvation. Life and death is in our hands. And you don't have to be some theological professor or theological genius. You don't have to be a scripture know-it-all. You don't have to have that thing, that good book memorized and to be able to know when and where everything is in there, what you have to have is a willingness to share God's love and the ability to tell your story, your gospel of how Jesus was transfigured before your eyes and how he is a living God and how the living gospel is still being written here and now as each of you draw breath and see Christ before you. And I know that you can tell your stories. I know that you can tell about the things that have happened in your life. Because it's an innate part of who we are as people. We tell stories. And we tell the stories that we know that happened to us the best. Because we experience them. Will you save the lives of the people outside of these walls? Are you willing to help God unveil His light, to heal their blindness, to remove their deafness so that they can hear the voice of God and that they can find eternal life? It's time the church unveils the light of Christ in the world. It's time we take our place in the stories of old and that we take up the mantle of the disciples and spread the living gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen.